Welcome to Canada Social Changemakers. My name is Justin Douglas, and today we're here with filmmakers, directors, and producers Michael Yerksa and Mark Kenneth Woods. We'll be talking about their latest award-winning documentary film, Two Soft Things, Two Hard Things, and their experiences in the Canadian film and television industry. Two Soft Things, Two Hard Things is a full-length documentary film about LGBTQ pride celebrations in Nunavut's capital, the Callaway and expands into a fascinating, informative, and emotional exploration of colonialism, privilege, and loss of culture. Well, thank you guys for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, you guys are probably staples of the Canadian film industry and television industry at this point, but how did you guys get involved uh, to start off with? How did you guys get onto OutTV and Logo and MTV Canada and all these other places you've been associated with at this point? Go ahead. Well, we have very <laughs> different paths, I think. Yeah. I don't. I was around in Vancouver when Pride Vision, it was called that at the time, mm -hmm. started. So, um, you know, just the right place, the right time, and um, I had been doing uh, queer-themed shorts uh, and putting them online, which was a new thing back then before uh, YouTube and everything. So, um, you know, we just approached them, and and then I ended up creating several series over uh, in the years, um, and yeah, I yeah. Know, uh, For me, um, I had a friend who was producing a new show at MTV Canada, um, and they wanted sort of, sort of an advice, um, an advice show, you know, so it was pitched originally with straight couples giving advice to other straight couples, and then they said, oh, maybe we'll have gay guys give advice to straight couples, and then it morphed into, let's just get gay guys to talk about their lives. Um, and then that turned into, you know, having, um, you know, lesbian panelists and bisexual panel panelists and trans panelists. And it became a show called One Girl, Five Gays, which we did four seasons of. Um, and it was bought by Logo and OTV. And through doing that show for me, I really found sort of my inner activist, my inner LGBT activist. And knew that I really wanted to continue to do work in terms of media um, in that sphere and in that universe. Uh, and so Mark, obviously, has... You know, twenty years of, of, of work in this in this world. Seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> Seventeen. Sorry, don't want to age you. Um, but you know, so we met um, and just immediately knew we wanted to work together, and just had to sort of wait for the perfect project to to um, materialize for us to, to have that opportunity. And the perfect project presented itself. So your film now, it's a documentary. It's called Two Soft Things, Two Hard Things. Mm -hmm. You directed, produced, and self-funded the film. Uh, but why don't you tell us a little bit about how the sort of idea came about, how you guys hooked up on the project, and how it started. <laughs> well, we just read an article in Extra yeah. about this pride celebration that was happening in the North. And um, we, you know, we're just like, that can't have happened easily. There must be more to this. There has to be a story behind it. Mm -hmm. um, as it turns out, there was a very big story behind mm -hmm. it. But yeah, so we reached out to uh, the people that were putting on Pride and were asking them if they were going to have more um, events, and they were, but it was two months away. So we didn't have time <laughs> to really sort of get funding or apply. I mean, two months is nothing. So we yeah. just um, did our research and took some of the money we, you know, the a little bit of change we made off of the last one and basically used it to go up to the Callaway. And we Did you have connections there already uh, or points of reference or you just sort of went in blind? We went in blind. I mean, I, I, didn't, I, we didn't know, I didn't know anyone from the community before we went up there and we reached out sort of with, we connected originally with kind of the person who ran the, you know, Callaway Pride Twitter mm -hmm. page and that was sort of our first point of contact. And, you know, we're storytellers, we love, you know, sort of, we're curious and we want to ask questions and this just seemed like something that so few people knew about. We know very little about the North um, as Southern Canadians. We're not taught about it in school. We don't know, you know, sort of the history of the Inuit um, and we don't know um, a lot about that region. Yeah. So for us, it's like, wow, they're doing this Pride event and the Pride event, you know, the description in this article, you know, they had you know, throat singing and a Greenlandic mask performance and a drag queen and, you know, it was a completely sold out event and it, it just felt like this is happening there. Like there's, there's so many places in Southern Canada where to get prize off the ground is such a struggle, but it seemed like up there it was like, it was robust and, and, and incredible and very interesting. So we knew that there was something there. And so when we went up, it was really about sort of making these connections very quickly and having the subjects trust us 
because we were there for three days. That's it, three days. Three days. Oh wow! That's all we could afford to be there for. So the work had to, you know, the work had to basically start. We, when we started, Mark was shooting out, out of the window of the plane, and, and we shot out of the window of the plane as we left. So our wow. work started like the second we landed, we were shooting, you know, and so. A, a lot of times, you know, I think because there's such a history of white saviorism with that part of the country of people going up and trying to make it better for mm -hmm. the Inuit and or the you know or the people of that that um, region, that we had to be very careful about <coughs> letting them know that we weren't going to exploit them, that we were, mm -hmm. you know, we were thoughtful in our questions, that we were sensitive about our approach to certain subjects that maybe were taboo, and so we went we went and just had to hit the ground running and really hope that people would trust us, and it was kind of word of mouth like people would people would say oh we you know we interviewed with them yesterday they asked really great questions I think maybe you should speak to them oh wow and a lot of times it was like you know, so, so and so giving another person their blessing and then contacting us and saying I think I, I'd be interested in interviewing with you guys oh wow that sounds like a really organic process it was quick <laughs> yeah, right. so when you got there what was the reception you started with the LGBT pride festival as your contact point but then you sort of explored the community in the three days you were there what was the reception like and the reactions while you were filming it was good I mean we it's uh, you know we did a lot of research we knew sort of what we were doing going into it it wasn't blind but we you know at any point somebody well, lots of people canceled actually and some people we got to interview that originally said no so a lot changed as things happen uh, during documentary filmmaking totally. but um, but what was interesting is our presence there actually affected the story, uh, which is not something you want necessarily, but it, it sort of forced people to think about Pride in a more mm -hmm. thoughtful way and who it was actually for and who it might not be including. And um, so there was sort of a lot of discussion uh, around what it should look like um, because we were coming. So I think, I, I think people wanted to put sort of their best foot forward, but it was mm -hmm. lovely. I mean, certainly... One of the most interesting prides I've ever been to, um, but we engaged. You know, again, we our approach was hopefully thoughtful. I mean, we we hope it was. I thought so because mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to be able to see it at the Never Apart screening here in Montreal, and I was blown away by the documentary. I thought it was absolutely moving and a great introduction into issues and cultures and people that I wouldn't necessarily have uh, a doorway into, and that right. I feel like I kind of should have as a Canadian citizen and someone who grew up here, I wish that I was exposed to these stories and cultures and ideas a lot right. earlier than just now. Um, so then you were able to do it, you shoot it all, and then now you have to get it out there. So what's that process like of the film festival circuit and, and how do you promote a, a documentary? Well, for us, our timeline was, you know, we shot it in October of 2015 um, and went right into editing it. Mark uh, edited the documentary. Oh wow, great yeah. job. We finished it by February of 2016, which is actually like an incredibly ridiculously fast post schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was because we wanted to get it, we wanted a Toronto premiere at the Inside Out Film Festival. Right. So for us it was really, it, uh, the timeline was sort of centered around getting into that festival and also that festival kind of is the start of like a summer LGBT sort of film festival circuit. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to kind of premiere there and then kind of work through the festivals. Um, and that process, you know, is, is you know, it's, it's very difficult. It's, you know, it's like submitting your film and kind of to these festivals and hoping that you get in, hoping, hoping that they see something in your work that is worth sort of screening at their festival. Uh, but we had, you know, a tremendous amount of success and got into, you know, there's, you know, there are many festivals we didn't get into, but there are way more that we did and, and the support of the festivals has been excellent. You guys have been killing it in the <laughs> festivals. Uh, you have won numerous awards during grand prizes, uh, LGBT recognition, uh, lots of positive notes. What's the reception been sort of beyond the film festival circuit? Watch it on Air Canada right now. Uh, so oh, well, good, let's mention that. So now you're on 90% of Air Canada flights? Yes, all domestic and international flights, I think. Transborder, I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. um, That's really cool. So if people yeah. want to see it, where can they find it on Air Canada? It's in the TV yeah. um, drop down documentary section. So you go to TV, go to documentary, and it's two soft things, two hard things. It's right there. 71 minutes, um, it'll make your flight um, much more enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> Much more enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what has the reaction been like then from uh, post after seeing the movie from the the participants and the community? It's been great. I mean, it's been 
it's been an absolutely fascinating. I mean, making it, of course, was, uh, you know, a real sort of eye opener mm -hmm. for both of us. And um, you know, was a real lesson in allyship. And I, I think we've both grown tremendously from the experience. Um, but also the Q and A's have been some of the most interesting aspects of the whole process. It's such a difficult subject to talk about for so many people um, up north or for religious people because it sort of brings up a history that most Canadians would love to ignore. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, it, you know, they're not the easiest conversations to have and they're not no. easy for us to to break apart and, and not everyone's happy with the film either. Uh, most people are, you know, are sort of go on this journey of learning um, mm -hmm. when they're watching the film. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, some not everyone's happy with it. Some people think it should have made been made locally, which I hundred percent agree that would have. Well, been let's lovely. take a transition though. So, being <coughs> non Indigenous filmmakers mm -hmm. uh, portraying some Indigenous perspectives, what was that reaction like? It was. I mean, it, it's tough because that part of the world has this history of white saviorism of people going up saying we're we're here to make it better, but not not. Um, really having the respect or sensitivity that that often is required mm -hmm. um, and, and having that sort of I know better attitude um, is not um, is, is never really the best attitude to no. to uh, bring to those situations so for us it was we were really conscious of sort of checking our privilege and checking um, it, and being strong allies and asking mm -hmm. the right questions and not pushing too far and and being really sensitive in the questions we were asking and thoughtful in the questions that we were asking. Um, and, you know, it, it's tough because, you know, a lot of, you know, some of the criticism is that we, we, we don't have the right to tell the film or to, to make the film. We didn't have the right to tell those stories. Um, in the film, there is no narration. So really it's the subjects are talking with their own points of view. We're not imposing sort of our voice on them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other thing too is that, you know, we are LGBT filmmakers. This is a story about LGBT identities. So I do right. think that we own, we have the right to be able to tell those stories um, right. because our, you know, our community is in every race, every culture, every ethnicity. Um, every religion around the world, you know, our people exist. So as LGBT filmmakers, I think it's it's um, our right to be able to tell those stories. Absolutely. Um, and, um, and a privilege to be able to tell those stories. So that was kind of, you know, for us, I'm like, these are these are my people. And, um, you know, and, and Mark said once, you know, he was like, you know, and if people are sort of threatening our people, like it, it's kind of one of our, our objectives as documentarians is to kind of sort of, show that, you know, show that, that system of, of, um, you know, discrimination and, yeah. and how our people are systematically kind of being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen a storyline about LGBT and the connection to Indigenous communities in Canada before ever. So I think you guys have found a niche, but a niche that is an important topic to be discussing. Right. Um, what has been the reaction internationally outside of Canada when you've been around the world and we're, we're telling our own stories finally as Canadians how has the outside world perceived it well it's been really interesting I mean we knew this ahead of time too but the the story is unique to Nunavut in so many ways but it's also universal um, I mean colonization is certainly not uh, unique to Canada um, mm -hmm. so you know there have been screenings in Africa and in India there were quite a few actually mm -hmm. um, and the story there is similar. A lot of these sort of identities have been um, hidden and pushed away mm -hmm. uh, because of colonization. So, I mean, you know, they they really relate to the story. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think it's been fascinating to see that there are different sort of um, cultures around the world that had different ideas about sexuality and family structure and all of that stuff. Um, yeah. And colonization really changed that, not for the better. <clears throat> well, no, it's, and it's, I, I think it's interesting, too, because I find that a lot of times people who look through, you know, a Christian lens or, you know, with, you know, sort of a religious lens, like to kind of just, you know, because they think it's wrong, they think our identities are, are wrong or immoral, they like to just erase that mm -hmm. from the narrative. So there's this idea of kind of like, okay, well, that just didn't exist, or we're not going to talk about that because we think it's wrong. And that is, you know, that, that is a, no, no matter where you go around the world, that is a trend in terms of LGBT identities, you know, mm -hmm. people who have these sort of, you know, religious or fundamental, fundamentally Christian views 
want to sort of just erase that because they don't like it. Mm -hmm. Not too bad for them because it's yeah. an important story that needs to be told. <laughs> well, it's a theme in our work too. It's really this, I mean, certainly I grew up without any sort of LGBT history in the history books, learning at school and stuff. And I think for us too, because, you know, I mean, it's the same with uh, women and, and people of color and all sorts of minorities, but like we're not, you know, we didn't write the history, so we're not there. We're mm -hmm. not present. So we're, you know, a lot of our work is sort of trying to go and uncover that and, and tell those stories that were lost along the way. How do you feel about uh, Nunavut and Inuit artists being able now to tell their own stories? What do you think is a, a way that we can help promote uh, storytellers being able to tell their own stories? Well, I think it's really important to, I mean, you know, part in our film, we, we address the fact that, you know, there aren't any, you know, in, living in the North right now, there aren't any sort of filmmakers, queer, indigenous, um, you know, filmmakers who could have made a film like ours, right? right. But hopefully our film, you know, I, I never look at our film as like the conversation. I look at it as like a tiny spoke in the wheel and we're, we just want it to be sort of a resource for people um, to look at it and to sort of, you know, to... To look at it as a tool or as a resource, right? Mm -hmm. But we're not, you know, and to continue the conversation going, right? right? So I hope our film, you know, and I hope our, our film encourages, you know, young filmmakers or young storytellers to um, to tell their own stories and to tell, you know, sort of their their own politics around identity and that sort of thing. But I, I and I hope that there's a way that's that you know, um, Alethea is one of the the subjects in our documentary, and she's a documentary a documentarian herself, and. I'm hoping that she can, you know, hopefully that there's some sort of funding that they can start to do some filmmaking in the schools up there mm -hmm. and that sort of thing because I think it would be really valuable to sort of start documenting mm -hmm. your own kind of truths. Yeah. Well, I was blown away yeah. by it. I yeah. really, it opened my mind to a lot of concepts and ideas that I hadn't thought about mm -hmm. before and to people like Athea who mm -hmm. really, I, she left a lasting impact with me totally. with her words. Uh, with Nuka, with Paul, with a lot of people who were Jack, mm -hmm. a lot of people in the movie. I still, I saw it a few months ago, but it still resonates with yeah. me, which is why it was so important for me to talk to you guys about it, because it did, it really, and for anyone who watches it, I think they'll have a similar experience. Right. Uh, but let's switch off the film a little sure. bit. Yeah. Uh, you guys have been so active in the Canadian film and entertainment industry. Where do we as Canadians do really well in telling our own stories, and how can we improve a little bit in telling our own stories? Big question. Yeah, it is. <laughs> We're good at telling them. We're just not great at funding them. That's, that's it. Yeah, that's I mean, that's sort of been a common that's theme. A, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think that um, we are. You know, like if you look at Canadian artists, you know, we're kind of always at the forefront of music and you know um, literature and filmmaking. Um, I think our I think our country is a bit broken in terms of like giving opportunities to our artists to really soar mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how we fix that I think that yeah. there's I think that there's you know larger sort of problems that you know kind of start up here and then and then the people down here who really need the funding and need the resources aren't getting it or right. aren't getting those opportunities mm -hmm. you know like if you look at us we have this great film um, and you know it's been in 50 different festivals and um, we've done you know and, and we're so proud of it, but we don't have a distributor in our own country. We right. can't, we've met with distributors, they don't think they can sell our work. So, so it's a, it's a... That's frustrating. It's really frustrating because you're kind of banging your head, you're like, we worked so hard, we're telling a story that has not been told before, um, you know, we're screening at all these festivals, all the feedback we're getting is really positive. We can't sell this to a our television own network, to a streaming platform, to, for people in our own country to see it. So. I just hope that we can figure out a way to start to really help independent artists in any capacity find mm -hmm. things and get their works shown in a, in a larger capacity. It starts with the audience, I mean, just as an individual, I mean, this goes for all of us, but just supporting those stories too, because we're so great at, you know, sort of embracing people once they've made it. Yeah. Um, but we don't help them a heck of a lot along the way. No. Um, so, no. you know, go out to the you know, random screening at the Cinematheque and, and um, you know, make an effort to go see those um, future stars uh, yeah. and that talent while it's, you know, uh, emerging. So if you haven't seen it yet, 
two soft things, two hard things available on Air Canada and many documentary circuit film festivals. I strongly, strongly encourage you to go see it. It is worth your time and worth having a conversation about. Thank you so much to both of you, Mark Kenneth Woods, Michael Yerksa. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for all the incredible work you're doing here in Canada. Thank you very Thank much you. for having us. Thank you.